Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Zephyr. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Melbourne. And this is the Quantitative Methods Network, or QMNet, here at the University of Melbourne. And today we've got a very exciting speaker and someone who many of you have probably heard of. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you've been online, he's got a great YouTube channel. And Eigen Steve, uh, which is, I laughed out loud last night when I saw that that was your the name, <laughs> your domain name for his website. And it's uh, Steve Brenton from the University of Washington. And he's gonna be talking today with us uh, about interpretable and generalizable machine learning for fluid dynamics. And let me just give a brief introduction here. Uh, <clears throat> Steve is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Washington, and he's an adjunct professor uh, of applied mathematics and a data science fellow at the eScience Institute at UW. Uh, he received a BS in mathematics from Caltech in 2006 and a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton in 2012. Uh, his work combines machine learning with dynamical systems to model and control systems in fluid dynamics, uh, biolocomotion, optics, energy systems, and manufacturing. And he's a co-author of three textbooks, uh, received the Army and Air Force Young Investigator Program Awards, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, and he was awarded the UW's uh, College of Engineering Junior Faculty and Teaching Awards. Uh, it's always nice to round out some of those more international things to a few local university awards. Uh, so thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time and uh, and take it away. Awesome. So thank you very much, uh, both for the kind invitation, but also for the introduction. So I'm really glad to be here. It's really a pleasure. Um, I, you know, I don't do time travel that much, but it's kind of cool to be giving a talk tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys hear that a little bit too much. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about our work. Um, and this is more broad than fluid dynamics. This is really about interpretable and generalizable machine learning for dynamical systems in general. Um, and I actually really like the email that you sent out, Michael, kind of giving that broader context that, you know, if you have a system of interest that is high dimensional, nonlinear, multi-scale, where you might have limited measurements and unknown governing equations. All of the things I'm going to talk about pretty much apply uh, to those systems. So you can think about epidemiology or financial markets or neuroscience, a network of neurons in the brain. I'm going to use uh, kind of my personal field of fluid mechanics as a canvas for exploring those ideas. But you know, any of these things probably do generalize. I also like to point out early on, I am completely fine if anyone wants to interrupt with questions, you can unmute yourself and just ask or put it in the chat or anything. Um, I always have more material than I have an hour's worth of time to give. So I'd be happy to kind of veer in different directions depending on what people are interested in. Okay, good. Uh, so before going too far, I want to acknowledge uh, some great colleagues, collaborators, co-authors, and partners in crime. Uh, so Nathan and I have developed most of this uh, machine learning for dynamical systems material together. And then I've applied this to fluid dynamics with uh, JC Loazo from Paris Tech uh, and Josh Proctor and Barrett Nowak have been involved in a lot of this too. And really almost everything I'm gonna tell you about today is in collaboration with our fantastic students and postdocs uh, pictured below. And this is really just kind of a zoom in snapshot of the group. Uh, so I'm only telling you about about a third of, of, of the group so far today. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about parallels this review article um, that I was fortunate enough to write and collaborate with uh, Barrett Nowak and Petros Kumitsakis on machine learning for fluid mechanics. But again, this very much uh, describes kind of how machine learning would fit into a modern scientific or engineering discipline where you do have partial knowledge of things like symmetries and conservation laws, or you might have like safety constraints. If you're designing an aircraft, you can't just have an opaque, uh, uninterpretable machine learning solution. And I think what, you know, time and time again, we keep hearing that uh, machine learning is going to take over that all fields of engineering and science are eventually gonna be sub-disciplines of, of uh, machine learning and computer science. I, I heard a prominent researcher say this recently, uh, and I think that's absurd. 
I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting perspective, but I don't think that that's what the future is going to hold. Uh, I think what's much more realistic is that this is going to become a complementary data processing uh, pipeline and framework that complements the existing theoretical, numerical, and experimental efforts that we have across the engineering sciences. And there's actually a really nice parallel with the rise of computational science in the 1980s, right? So I talked to researchers at Boeing, you know, and some of us remember when uh, the hype back then was that, you know, Boeing's never going to run another wind tunnel test again because simulations are going to replace our, our wind tunnel experiments. And of course, that never panned out. Computations augment and complement our experiments, but they've never replaced them. And so I believe that's the same, same picture here with machine learning. Okay, so before going too far, I want to kind of define uh, what we're talking about in a common term terminology uh, so that we're all speaking the same language. Um, and I, I like talking to technical audiences like this because I think, um, you know, all of us are a little bit more savvy about optimization and applied math and statistics. But oftentimes, uh, you know, when I give this talk to business leaders, you get the impression that maybe they think of machine learning as a magic wand. I'm going to mix my metaphors here. So, you know, they've got some big, hairy engineering problem. It's costing them $100 million a year, and they're going to point, you know, machine learning at it and poof, everything's going to become simple. And of course, we know that that's not how the world works, right? These are principled optimization techniques uh, based on data. And so, you know, again, in my field of fluid mechanics, where they're this is a key technological enabler. There are millions, you know, uh, billions of dollars of potential savings in key technologies like energy, transportation, health, uh, defense that could be um, realized if we could optimize our fluid flows a little bit better. And so I like to think about kind of the tasks. Um, again, these are in blue, my fluid dynamics tasks, but these are really just engineering tasks in general and how all of the tasks that I care about as an engineer in terms of dimensionality reduction, so compressing my high dimensional data, reduced order modeling, finding a low dimensional surrogate model that is accurate and efficient, uh, optimal sensing, where would I put sensors in a complex system to estimate its behavior, uh, and control. All of those engineering tasks in blue are really hard optimization tasks. They're hard because our governing equations, our, our physics, our systems of interests are typically nonlinear and multi-scale. And this leads to high dimensional and non-convex optimization problems. Non-convex meaning that there's lots of local minima that uh, you could search for, and the best minima is often very hard to find. And so machine learning is an emerging set of mathematical optimization techniques that are very, very well suited for these kinds of high dimensional, nonlinear, non-convex challenges. And so if I'm going to pigeonhole, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that machine learning is simply uh, an improved way of building models from data with optimization and regression. So it's what we've been doing for at least 50 years as engineers, but it is enhanced with incredible volumes of data, much better optimization algorithms, and high-performance computing architectures. And so we're starting to be able to solve some of these really hard optimization problems to address some of these really, really challenging engineering tasks with these emerging techniques uh, in machine learning. And so I'm going to walk you through at a very high level how my group approaches this. Um, and this is kind of taking a step back from fluids and from dynamical systems. Um, my wife likes to joke that I'm a bit of a control freak. I try to put everything in the world I care about in this blue box, my dynamical systems box. Uh, and then we're going to try to develop control laws to manipulate the behavior of that system. So I don't just want to understand systems with, with dynamics. I want to manipulate their behavior for some engineering advantage or goal. And we're going to do this by measuring through our sensors and affecting through our actuators. And so we can use machine learning uh, techniques or data-driven optimization to directly build models of the dynamics from measurement data. And again, I'm going to um, talk mostly about interpretable and generalizable modeling as opposed to kind of the, the opaque neural network modeling that is pretty popular today. And there's nothing wrong with neural networks. They're incredibly powerful and expressive architectures, but sometimes we need our models to be more explainable and interpretable. Okay, so we're going to put a premium on that. 
Now we might bypass modeling the dynamics entirely and then go directly to trying to learn good adaptive control laws through trial and error, through a kind of biologically inspired iterative learning process. And this could be um, kind of a deep model predictive control or reinforcement learning or other optimizations to manipulate the behavior of our system. And then the third kind of major avenue of research in my lab uh, focuses on using uh, these data-driven optimizations to highlight key measurement locations, which give the most information to inform the models and the controllers that we're gonna be developing. And this is actually really cool work. Um, so this is work in collaboration with my, my wife, Bing, and much of this is biologically inspired. So we observe that flying insects, every single one of them, have on the order of tens to hundreds of strain sensitive neurons uh, distributed across their wings. So they're pictured here in these red dots. And experimentalists have uh, observed that if you hit these insects, so this is a moth, it's about the size of my hand, if you hit this moth with a gust of wind, it can correct, it can change its wing beat pattern faster than the information can go from its sensors up to its brain and back to its muscles, which is pretty remarkable. So what that means is that there is a local computation that's happening in the shoulder muscle of this moth that is then being directly fed back to its muscles for very fast, low latency, robust control. And this is the kind of distributed sensing and modeling and embodied computing and control that we as engineers would also like to have in our engineering systems, whether it's our own wings or uh, a more abstract complex system like a manufacturing line or something like that, where you want to be able to measure, compute locally, and make very fast decisions uh, for robust performance. Okay, good. Now I'm going to talk uh, again, I'm going to start going through vignettes of how we can use machine learning for physical systems like fluid mechanics. Um, and all of this really predicates on the fact that there are patterns that exist in our data. So machine learning in general relies on their existing patterns in the data and modern fluid mechanics and most high dimensional engineering systems also relies on the existence of these patterns. So here I'm showing a picture uh, from a great review paper by Sam Tyra, where you have the cloud flow over Rishiri Island uh, in Japan. And even though this is an extremely complex geophysical flow at a very high Reynolds number, this would take supercomputers to simulate, it exhibits the same dominant flow pattern as a much, much simpler uh, flow pass to cylinder model below, which we can simulate on our laptops. And we know that there are reduced order models that can be expressed by a couple of ordinary differential equations. So I found this really cool movie version of this uh, on Twitter. So this is a movie of that same pattern formation over Guadalupe Island. Uh, and, and so the existence of those patterns is what we're going to use for kind of our first step in applying machine learning to these physical systems. Okay, so we need patterns to exist. And the second uh, kind of takeaway here that we're going to use is that if we can, if we can view our data as an image sequence, if we can uh, kind of imagine that the data we're collecting from our complex system, if we can arrange it as an image or an audio sequence, then we can immediately apply very, very powerful machine learning optimizations off the shelf technology that's been developed by places like Google and Facebook with tons of, of investment. So that's going to be our starting point. And to start off, I'm going to highlight this really cool work by Isabel Sherl. She's a PhD student uh, at UW working with Brian Pelagi and myself. And she is interested in marine renewable energy. So essentially like wind turbines, but in rivers and tidal basins and, and deltas. And so oftentimes she's an experimentalist. And oftentimes the data she gets is quite noisy and it has outliers uh, and kind of salt and pepper noise. It looks like TV static on top of her data. Uh, and so this movie X here is supposed to be kind of a cartoon of how bad experimental data could get. So she's a very good experimentalist, so her data doesn't look this bad. This is like a caricature. And what she's going to do in this work is essentially leverage a machine learning optimization developed for image sciences to decompose that noisy movie X, that kind of experimentally acquired uh, image sequence with noise, into a low rank matrix L, which has all of the coherent structures, the patterns we talked about, and then a sparse matrix S that has all of the noise and outliers and occlusion. 
And so you should be asking yourself at this point or saying to yourself, this is too good to be true. It's uh, too much to ask. You know, there are infinitely many ways I can take one matrix X and decompose it into the sum of two matrices L plus S. This is an ill-posed problem. And you're absolutely right. So that's why we need to write down an optimization uh, loss function or cost function that uh, promotes a single unique solution that has the properties we want. So out of all of the infinitely many L's and S's that can add up to equal X, we are specifically looking for an L and an S that minimizes the rank of L and the zero norm of S. Okay, so the rank of L is how many linearly independent patterns describe the data, and the zero norm of S is just how many non-zero elements there are in S. Now, that turns out to be an intractable, uh, combinatorially hard brute force problem. So this optimization is non-convex and does not scale to large problems like this flow field. And so there is a relaxation that was developed 10 years earlier by Candes et al. Uh, in their robust principal components analysis, there's a way of relaxing this optimization problem to something that is convex and with very high probability converges to the true solution that we want. So we swap out the rank of L for the nuclear norm of L, uh, just the sum of the singular values. And we swap out the zero norm of S for the one norm, the sum of the absolute values of the entries of S. And this, again, is a convexification that with high probability yields uh, that decomposition above. And so the movie I'm showing you is actually the result of Isabel applying this algorithm to her data. So this is not actually a cartoon anymore. That L and S matrix are the two matrices you get when you decompose that, decompose that noisy X using this optimization. Now, again, uh, if you have data that has outliers or extreme events or anomalies or missing data, even if it's not a flow field, you can apply this exact same technique to your data. OK, and the modes that you get out, kind of these, these physical structures, the patterns uh, of correlation in that data in that L matrix, uh, which are visualized in this right column, the RPCA column, are much closer to the true modes than if you did a, a standard principal components on the noisy data in X. So you get much better correlations and, no, and uh, pattern extraction. And you can build better dynamical systems models for how those patterns evolve in time. So dynamic mode decomposition is a best fit linear operator that advances snapshots of your data forward in time. And if you do DMD on the raw data in X, that's what we have in the left, you get a really, really bad model with lots of eigenvalues that are kind of over damped inside the unit circle. They should be perfectly on the unit circle because it's a periodic system, but they're over damped. Whereas when we do this robust filtering procedure, this RPCA, and we apply DMD to that L matrix that's clean, we get a much better model with periodic structures on the unit circle. So we also can use this for better actionable predictions uh, and estimations and control decisions in the future. Okay, good. So another area that is really, really uh, kind of ripe for using techniques that exist in industry is super resolution. So again, in, uh, in industry, there has been just decades of focused research trying to take low resolutions like the image on the left and fill it in with high resolution images like the one on the right. Again, this sounds like it's way too good to be true, right? There's infinitely many high res images that can be downsampled to give that low res image. But we are relying on the statistical uh, patterns in, in, for in this case, human eyes and, and human faces, so that even though there are infinitely many possible high res images, there are some that are more statistically likely or consistent than others. And that's what these super resolution algorithms play on, is, is using those, those correlations. So again, in the physical sciences and the engineering sciences, like fluid mechanics or climate science or neuroscience, we have limited measurements. We often are measuring on a much coarser grid than we would like to be measuring on. And we want to try to infer what uh, a finer resolution measurement would look like if I had a more expensive uh, you know, measurement campaign, if I had better equipment or more money or more time to measure more things. And so again, I'm going to illustrate this in this example of fluid mechanics, but you can apply this to any physical system uh, that can be viewed as an image, where the data looks like an image. And so this is work by Ben Erickson, uh, who is a postdoc with Nathan and me. 
And he essentially is developing a very simple shallow decoder network. So instead of these deep, deep uh, kind of neural network architectures, this is a relatively shallow uh, decoder that takes low resolution uh, data on the input and fills in high resolution data on the output. So you basically give it input output pairs of low resolution, high resolution, low resolution, high resolution uh, from training data. So kind of like the snapshot A and B in the top. And then what the shallow decoder will do is it will learn to take inputs like B, this low resolution downsampled image, and fill in the details as in panel C. And you can see that uh, this kind of shallow decoder reconstruction is almost perfectly capturing the features of the true snapshot. So it really does learn kind of the hierarchical multi-scale structure, the fine scale structure that's statistically in your data. Uh, and so, you know, this works really, really well. Um, we were surprised how well it worked. And so I started asking Ben a couple of probing questions to see if we could actually start deploying this in real fluids experiments. And so I asked him, how do you set up your training data? So this is uh, data we got from the Johns Hopkins uh, turbulence data set. It's basically a long time series of an evolving turbulence flow field in time. So a bunch of snapshots in time. And so what Ben did for this example is he trained on all of these black or dark gray columns. So this is the snapshots in time. So he trained on the dark gray columns and he tests on the light blue columns. Now you'll notice that the light blue columns are kind of sandwiched between training data. So this is how oftentimes it's done in machine learning where you randomly shuffle your data and you pull out 80% for training and 20% for testing. That's what he did here. But in some sense, what that does is it formulates this as an interpolation problem. So every reconstruction we do in the future is an interpolation between things we've already seen. And neural networks are famously good at interpolation problems. They are incredible interpolation engines, but they're very poor at extrapolation. So I asked Ben, OK, it works great for interpolation. Let's try it the other way where we actually take a consecutive chunk of data, the first 80% in time, and we train on those gray columns, and then we test on the next 20% in time, those light blue columns. And what we noticed is maybe not so surprising, for short times after the training, we get fairly good estimates, not as good as before, but as you go farther and farther from your training data, as you become closer to this extrapolation limit, our estimates really rapidly degrade and we get very poor uh, flow field reconstructions. So this is a really important uh, feature I want to kind of convey to everyone is that interpolation, if you can set your problem up like an interpolation, it's going to work great. But extrapolation is much more challenging. Um, and I would argue that the only models that we know of that extrapolate are physics models. In fact, that's a pretty good working definition of physics is the bits of the model that generalize uh, or that you can extrapolate on. So I'm going to tell you some solutions we have to make our models more extrapola uh, extrapolatory or extrapolation friendly, but those are going to necessarily involve baking in some, some kind of partially known physics in the situation or symmetries or constraints. Uh, and I'll point out, it gets even worse than this, right? So if we're going to use machine learning for something like climate prediction, um, at least in this turbulence example, we believe that the data is statistically stationary. It doesn't change statistically kind of uh in time whereas something like the climate the last 80 years is presumably not that representative of the next 80 years and so the fact that that system is actually changing and is moving away from uh, where the training data was generated makes it that much more important to be baking in physics at any step possible okay so i'm a huge proponent of not doing blind machine learning on physical systems but really trying to make them physical when possible or else you're going to run into problems with extrapolation okay good any questions up until this point i think it's all good all right all right so i'm gonna start now slowly kind of adding in physics uh, to this. And we're still going to look at our data kind of like images, but we're going to start adding in physics. So um, this is a really, really cool piece of work by Jared Callahan, a fantastic PhD student in my lab, where he is essentially trying to automate 
the dimensionality reduction and dominant balance uh, and kind of dimensionless scaling arguments that have been going on in physics for the last 50, 100 years, um, but in an automated data-driven way. So he's going to apply this technique he calls dominant balance uh, to this turbulence, um, this turbulent boundary layer. This is again from Johns Hopkins. But again, any complex system you have that varies in space and time, you can apply this method to. So I'll show you some examples later where we've applied this to neuroscience, uh, ocean data, lasers, you know, combustion engines, things like that. And this idea of dominant balance is really cool. So back in like the 1950s and the 1960s, before we had powerful computers, what people would do is they would take governing equations like the Navier-Stokes equations, and they would write them out, and they would try to make scaling arguments for when certain terms are small and other terms are large and balanced. And so they would find these limiting regimes like the boundary layer or like the free stream where different dominant physics was, was, uh, was kind of active, and they could simplify the equations to something that they could solve by paper and pencil. And so finding these regions where different physics are active is exactly what Jared's going to do in this dominant balance procedure. So we take this turbulence data set, we uh, compute the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes fields. If you're not into fluids, that's fine. This is basically, this measures, uh, you know, Reynolds stresses that determine how the turbulence evolves. So this is important for aircraft manufacturers to be able to model these terms. And then for each term in this equation, there's six terms you can compute that term for every point in space. And so this is the spatial field of that single term in the equation. You can do that for all six terms. And what's really cool now is that you can start to think about your, your system not in terms of a spatial temporal system with equations, but for every point in space, you can think of what that point's value is in that six-dimensional equation space. So there is a six dimensional space where each axis is one term of this equation and every point in space has a value in those six coordinates. And so if I scatter plot or if Jared scatter plots all of the data, all of the spatial points in that boundary layer, uh, this is just two two dimensional cross sections of our six dimensional equation space. This is where the points live. Now remember, we're trying to find regions that live in sparse subspaces where most of the active terms are nearly zero and only a couple terms are active and balancing each other, which actually looks like some of these, uh, these diagonals and subspaces. So what Jared does is he applies a relatively straightforward clustering algorithm. This is a Gaussian mixture model. And then he tries to find sparse subspaces that best fit those clusters and those sparse subspaces correspond to regions, to, to clusters of points, like these red points, where only two of the model terms are active and the other ones are nearly zero or balancing. And so in this case, he gets uh, five regions. And when you actually plot those regions back in physical space, you rediscover these, these known kind of dominant balance regions in the boundary layer. So we know that we have a viscous sublayer uh, near the, the kind of wall of your airplane. And then we have an inertial sublayer where mixing occurs, and then the free stream. And so all of these regions that have been uh, hard fought over 100 years with many, many brilliant minds kind of writing these down by hand, you can actually start to uncover these automatically purely from your data. So all you need is spatial temporal data and some idea of what terms might be active in those equations. And you can start applying these clustering algorithms to start painting your systems with what physics is active in what regions. Now, we've applied this to the boundary layer, but many, many other systems also. Uh, so one of the ones I think is super cool is uh, this optical pulse propagation. This is basically a super continuum laser, a high energy laser. And uh, what's really interesting in this laser system is that researchers for a long time have believed that this is a fundamentally strongly nonlinear process. Right, like lasers uh, are, are inherently kind of nonlinear Schrodinger equation phenomena. And what we have found, if you look at this panel in the right with the zoom in and that little thin blue strip, 
what we find is that the region where nonlinearity is active is very, very narrow in the space-time diagram. And that's pretty cool. So that actually gives some idea of where nonlinearity is focused and where our computations would have to be uh, kind of more sophisticated to capture that phenomenon. We've also applied this to data from the Gulf of Mexico. So this is, um, you know, velocity field data for mixing uh, in the ocean. And we've started to rediscover known uh, kind of geophysical balance laws, like geostrophic balance and things like that in the ocean. And the goal is that if we can relearn the things that people already know, we can start to uncover new patterns and new balance relationships uh, to characterize more challenging balances like mesoscale dynamics in the ocean, which is the subject of intense research effort for modeling the climate, for predicting the weather with greater forecast, uh, and for understanding these ocean processes. And we've also applied it to systems uh, that are a little bit less traditional, like this bursting neuron example, where uh, essentially you can uncover different regions of activation in axons, in nerve cells, that correspond to different ion channels being activated and deactivated. So again, purely from data, you can kind of recapitulate some of this, uh, you know, like Nobel Prize theory for, uh, for how neurons work. And so I really like giving this part of the talk because this is an area that's brand new. And if you have data and equations, you can start to paint your fields like this too and start to uncover uh, ideally new physics, interpretable physics. Okay, good. So we've started off with kind of very simple application of machine learning to uh, engineering data that looks like images. Now we've started adding in physics and thinking about equation spaces and governing equations, but we're still uh, doing relatively simple machine learning. Now I'm going to talk about how we can use machine learning techniques to get better predictive models, reduced order models of dynamical systems that evolve in time. So I want to get models like uh, x dot equals f of x, some differential equation that will predict the behavior of my system forward in time that I can use for control. And at this point, I'm going to go a little bit on a soapbox. I'm going to give you a little bit more of my take on the philosophy of kind of how machine learning should fit in with engineering sciences. Uh, and this is where we really talk about interpretable and generalizable machine learning. So there is a critical, critical need for machine learning that is not just more predictive and accurate, like a bigger, deeper neural network but machine learning that is accurate and efficient and can be interpreted or explained and can generalize to new situations beyond the training data where you generated the model. Now, whenever I try to define interpretable and generalizable, I usually get into a fight. And so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you an analogy instead. And I think the best analogy for interpretable generalizable models is Newton's F equals MA. Okay, so this is the quintessential interpretable model. It has three terms, force, mass, and acceleration. They have units. We can write them down for a particular problem and analyze them and find the fixed points and the stability. We can go to a coffee shop and communicate together and discuss what F and M and A mean for your problem. So it's interpretable. And it's highly generalizable. So I challenge you to find a more generalizable model. F equals MA can be learned from apples falling on Earth, or at least that's how the story goes. And this model is still true when we land humans on the moon. So that's generalizable, OK? It's way beyond where we trained this model. It still holds. Now, I guarantee that if we had enough videos of apples falling, if we had 10,000 videos of apples falling, we could build a neural network that would make our own new videos of new apples falling, but it would not be useful when we decide to land humans on the moon. Okay, so these are the kind of models we want. <clears throat> and the features I want you to observe are that it is somehow sparse. There's only a few terms that helps with interpretable and generalizable, and it's kind of low dimensional. And this isn't just Newton's F equals MA. This is also Einstein's E equals MC squared. And it goes all the way back to Aristotle in Western physics and mathematics, this principle that the models that typically generalize are the models that capture uh, the observed data as simply as possible, but no simpler. So the model is as simple as possible to describe the data, but no simpler. 
Those are the models that tend to capture the physics bits that generalize, okay? And so mathematically, as engineers and optimization and machine learning experts today, what we do uh, to enforce these is we look for models that are low dimensional. So they describe only a few variables, how they evolve in time, and they are sparse. Out of all of the possible functions I can use to describe the dynamics of how those low dimensional patterns interact, there are only a few key mechanisms of interaction. So low dimensional and sparse is how we are going to promote interpretable, generalizable machine learning. Good. And if you fast forward from Newton to the present era, this looks a whole lot like the Lorentz 1963 butterfly attractor model for Rayleigh Bernard convection. So probably all of us have seen this Lorentz attractor on the right and have heard of the butterfly effect and this you know, being used to describe chaos and sensitive dependence on initial condition. This turns out to be a model of thermal convection in the atmosphere. So this is the simplest three mode model that gives rise to kind of the chaotic convection that you would observe in thermal fluid systems like our Earth's atmosphere. And this has many of the features we're looking for. So it's low dimensional. This, this model is expressed in terms of X, Y, and Z, three variables that describe the amplitudes of three spatial modes. Those modes were earlier postulated by Saltzman uh, in 1962, and X, Y, and Z express what is the amplitude of those three modes in time that would add up to describe this convection. So it's low dimensional. It's sparse in the sense that out of all of the possible terms on the right hand side that you could have to describe how X dot, Y dot, and Z dot behave, the right hand side has very, very simple sparse dynamics. There are only seven terms and most of them are linear. So out of all of the possible things you could imagine writing down to describe this complex chaotic phenomenon, sines and cosines and Bessel's functions and arc tangents, this is relatively simple and sparse, okay? And so that's what we're going to do in this last part of the talk is we are going to essentially automate this Lorentz 1963 modeling procedure so that if I have measurement data from a complex system, I can obtain models like this that are low dimensional and sparse that have some hope of being generalizable and interpretable. Okay, good. So I'm actually going to warm up and demonstrate this on that Lorentz 1963 data. So we're going to have this system, and we know that it has, you know, these three differential equations. Those are our ground truth. We know that there are systems of equations that generate this data. But we are going to assume that our algorithm only has access to measurements of x, y, and z, and that we can compute the derivatives x dot, y dot, and z dot uh, from, from those, those measurements. So uh, these columns are essentially measurements at each point in time going down. So time one, time two, time three, time four, and so on and so forth. The simplest thing we can do, okay, and I'll tell you, this is called the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics or SINDI algorithm that I'm, I'm walking you through uh, that I developed with Josh Proctor and Nathan Kutz. Now, the absolute simplest thing you could do to model the dynamics of this data is try to find a best fit linear operator A, a little three by three matrix that best fits X dot, Y dot, and Z dot as a linear combination of X, Y, and Z. This is what the dynamic mode decomposition does. And this is almost uh, like, again, a caricature of why that won't work for complex systems. Because we know that the Lorentz attractor uh, can't be described by a three by three linear system of equations. The A matrix has a single fixed point at the origin, but our Lorentz attractor has three fixed points and unstable periodic orbits and this whole chaotic uh, attractor. So we can't do this modeling with a linear model. And so instead what the Cindy optimization does is it augments the right hand side with more candidate nonlinear terms that could describe the dynamics of X dot, Y dot, and Z dot. And so instead of just x, y, and z, uh, we also have polynomials in this case, x squared, x, y, y squared, all the way up to z to the fifth. And you could include any nonlinear terms you like, trigonometric functions, Bessel's functions, anything your heart desires, you can put into this library. I just usually start out with simple polynomials because those give us good Taylor series approximations for most systems. And so now the name of the game, and, and I'll point out all of those gray columns, x squared, x, y, y squared, we can compute those from the data we have in the blue, red, and green columns. So now the goal 
is to find the sparsest, the fewest terms in that theta library of candidate terms that add up to equal x dot, y dot, and z dot. Now, when I started this, I thought that was really hard, doing that sparse optimization. Because when I was growing up in applied math, finding the sparsest combination of a library that equals another vector was a combinatorially hard, NP-hard problem. But in the last 10 or 20 years, great advances in robust statistics, a lot of them out of Stanford, have um, essentially made this a set of commodity algorithms. So now finding the sparsest combination of theta columns that equals x dot, y dot, and z dot is a commodity. There are dozens of algorithms to do this. We have our own that we like, but it's, it's pretty easy to do. And if you'll notice, the terms that are highlighted by x dot are the linear terms x and y that actually appear in the equations. Same for y dot, we get an x, a y, and an x, z, which are in the equations. And for z dot, we get a z and an x, y term. And so when we show uh, kind of the full system, what we realize is that we have uncovered the full nonlinear equations of motion. So this is nonlinear structure identification and parameter identification. And so we identified the actual honest to goodness Lorentz model that generated the data in the first place, even though we never saw those equations, we just saw the data. Okay, so if you're interested in trying this, I would recommend uh, checking out this PyCindy package. So we are really keen on open uh, source reproducible research. And so every uh, paper we write, basically, we put out open source code. And this PyCindy will allow you, if you have time series data, to start trying this out yourself to uncover these nonlinear sparse models. Okay, now I'll show you another cool application of this. Again, the example is fluid, but if you have any spatial temporal system, you can apply this, where instead of just identifying ordinary differential equations, we use this technique to identify partial differential equations. So here we have data, again, from our fluid simulation, and we collect all of the relevant spatial fields, the vorticity field, the x and y velocity fields, u and v, in space and in time. And now we build the same SIMD library procedure, except here, instead of polynomials of x, what we have are partial derivatives and nonlinear products of partial derivatives. And when you try to find the sparsest combination of these terms, you end up with a partial differential equation. And when you apply this procedure, this is great work by Sam Rudy, who is a PhD student working with us. He's now a postdoc at MIT. You end up uh, uncovering the actual Navier-Stokes equations that was used to generate the data. So again, we only had access to that measurement data, and we can learn the governing equation that generated the data. And we even get the Reynolds number, kind of the order parameter, to within 1% of the true value. And one other point I'll point out is that because spatial temporal data is often so vast, there's so much of it, you can dramatically downsample in space and time, and you still can get a very good estimate of the model. So I think this is pretty phenomenal. Um, this means that from measurement data, you can rediscover partial differential equations that govern that system. And every system we have applied this to where we knew the answer, we rediscovered that un underlying physics, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, things like that. And so uh, collaborators and researchers across the globe are currently applying this to uncover new physics and systems like plasmas and, and other more complex systems. So there's a couple things I want to point out here, um, and I'm going to start winding down for the questions in a minute. A couple things I want to point out. Our procedure, our Cindy modeling procedure here, where we do this sparse uh, regression, we essentially have a custom sparse regression algorithm. And the way we find the sparsest combinations is by first doing a least squares pseudo inverse. We literally just pseudo invert theta using the SVD to find a C matrix of all of the coefficients of what terms are active. And what happens when you do least squares in a library like this is you get a model that has a little bit of non-zero values in all of the model terms. And that says that all of those 81 terms that could be in the model have a little bit of contribution. But most of those coefficients are very small and a couple are peaking out. And so what we do is we threshold and zero out all of the small coefficients. And then we do another least squares onto the remaining coefficients. And now some of those drop out. 
And then we do another least squares and then some of those drop out. And we do that iteratively until it converges on this sparse pattern you see here. So we call this sequential thresholded least squares. And since then, our optimization colleague, uh, colleagues have shown us that this is a rigorous relaxation of that zero norm problem. But the point I want to get across here is because we're doing least squares at every single step, it is very, very simple to include constraint equations in our least squares. So constrained least squares is a really well-developed uh, optimization algorithm. And so if you have partial knowledge of your system, like you know that there is a certain symmetry where the nonlinear terms have to be skew symmetric, or you know that certain terms are related by some constitutive equation, you can enforce that directly as constrained least squares in every step of this. And so we've applied this to lots of systems in fluids where we know that we can conserve energy through a certain symmetry, or we observe other symmetries. And by baking in that physics to the sequential threshold least squares, we get much, much more accurate models with way less training data, okay? Because we're fitting less model parameters. Okay, so the last thing I wanna tell you um, is kind of how this can break down, what can go wrong. So there are three stages of the Cindy learning procedure. The first one is figuring out what the right variables are to measure in the first place. So we had access to X, Y, and Z, which happened to be the right measurement variables. But, you know, I talked to my wife, who's a neuroscientist, they don't know what the right measurement variables are for the brain. So even getting the right X coordinates is a major, major open challenge uh, in dynamical systems modeling. And we kind of got lucky here or skirted that issue. So that's the first one. The second major challenge is in building this library theta. That's not as bad. If you have some partial knowledge of the physics, like I know that my fluid systems have quadratic nonlinearities, so I'm going to include quadratic polynomials and higher order polynomials in my library. Or if we're dealing with uh, nonlinear optic systems, like my uh, collaborator Nathan Kutz, we're going to add terms that appear in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, like these mod u squared u terms. So figuring out the, the library elements of theta is also challenging, but maybe not as hard as finding the coordinates. And then the third challenge is applying the sparse regression algorithm that satisfies the constraints that finds a good sparse solution. And nowadays, that's probably the easiest. So uh, I'll just give you a teaser of what we do when we don't know the right coordinates. And this is really cool work by, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. This one, this is really cool work by Kathleen Champion, who is a PhD student with Nathan and me, where essentially what she did was combine this Cindy modeling procedure to get parsimonious models with a deep autoencoder neural network to get good coordinate transformations. So what she does is she learns a coordinate transformation phi that maps us into a latent space Z where a sparse nonlinear model exists and then she learns a decoder psi that can map us back to our original measurement space. And so this is a really powerful idea that if you don't know the right coordinates, you can add this additional layer of coordinate transformations uh, so that the dynamics become simpler. And I think this is really cool. So, uh, you know, all across kind of engineering, people are doing this. They're taking these kind of deep autoencoder networks and constraining the middle layer to be dynamically consistent or dynamically predicted. And I think this is a lot like, uh, I think about this in terms of the kind of Copernican revolution in uh, how we understood the solar system, where if you just think about your data as being Earth-centered, the geocentric uh, perspective that was held you know, from Aristotle on up until Copernicus, the data is very complicated. It's very hard to get a simple model that describes this data. But when you find the right coordinate system, the right coordinate transform, like the heliocentric view, then the dynamics become much, much simpler, and it's easier to find a simple model. So I would argue that Kepler and Newton, you know, their discoveries really fundamentally rested on this first finding a simple coordinate system. Okay. Uh, and so I think with that, there's, there's more stuff I could tell you about, but that's probably all I have time for. So with that, I would like to stop uh, for questions. And thank you all so much for the attention. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really great. Uh, let's, uh, let's open it up uh, for questions. We see uh, Nora Han 
Uh, would you like to go ahead and? Um, yeah. Hi there. Uh, so uh, sorry about the background noise. Um, so okay. I had, um, I'm actually like I have watched uh, a lot of Steven's uh, videos about Koopman operator and um, neural network analysis for Koopman operator and how we combine it with control models um, and how we can have an identified system uh, for a control model. And uh, basically my research is about um, having that, but it's built on uh, thermal distribution inside uh, a zone and how we combine Koopman operator um, and reduced order modeling uh, for the thermal comfort indices or index uh, and have it as a simplified model for an MPC controller. Um, so um, I had like um, like more of technical questions relating to the training of the neural network and also like the um, what to discover like what is um, so now I'm in a phase on looking into my thermal index uh, thermal comfort index and trying to understand what are the uh, coordinates that I should be building my model on uh, wow. through Koopman operator. So do you have any like recommendations regarding that part. I've read the um, uh, the uh, paper that you have described the um, the same turbulence with the cylinder and um, the case where you have the turbulence after the cylinder and how you have uh, applied the Koopman operator into that case. Um, so if I'm trying to use like um, not non like um, equations, like different equations and different um, modeling in that case. So what would be the most principles that I'm looking for into my thermal index uh, or my thermal comfort index? So yeah, basically, that, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think I, I, think I understand the, the basic question and maybe I'll, I'll start answering and you can tell me if, if, if this makes sense. Um, sure. Yeah. So Finding a good, so so I didn't talk about Koopman at all, um, but for those of the audience who are interested, so Koopman theory takes this idea of finding coordinate systems where your dynamics are simple to the logical extreme, where instead of being simple, they are linear. Okay, so what Koopman tries to do is find these coordinate transformations phi that are these kind of magic, you know, looking glasses. If you look at your system through these coordinates, everything is linear. And there's some theoretical justification from the 1930s for why that could possibly exist. And the goal then is that if you can find these coordinates, even if it's a very expensive offline optimization, supercomputer optimization, then online in the field, you know, in your experiment, you could then apply optimal linear control theory uh, to manipulate that system in way, way faster, easier, more robust ways. And so, there's a huge focus uh, across the globe. And actually there's great people um, in uh, University of, of New South Wales working on these Koopman embeddings that are essentially trying to find these coordinates phi that give you these, these linearizations. Um, so a couple of things, you can use neural networks to do that. That's, this is the paper you're talking about with Bethany Lush. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what I would recommend for model predictive control. So actually, Ulrike Kaiser wrote a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, I want to say it was 2018, uh, basically on Cindy for model predictive control in the low data limit. And she compared um, a DMD model, the simplest linear model possible, a Cindy mm -hmm. model, and a full-blown neural network that actually captured you know, all of the, the dynamics. Okay. And what she found was that the DMD model actually worked like almost as well as the best neural network model. It was like 95% as good, but you could train it with 10 snapshots of data. So you oh, could wow. train it like immediately <laughs> to get a good DMD model. And then that DMD model provided a stopgap until you could learn a better Cindy model. Mm -hmm. And then if that Cindy model still isn't good enough, then you can focus your energy on something more like a, you know, a deep neural network model or a deep Koopman model. But that's like the big guns you would only bring out if you absolutely needed to, I think. So I would recommend okay. trying DMD. It's like remarkably good for okay. a lot of these problems. Yes. Yeah, uh, great, great question. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it answered the question. Like I will start with the DMD and then like I can uh, advance into the Koopman operator in that case. Thank you so much for the talk as well. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, that was great. Uh, anybody else? Feel free to just jump in. Thank you for the great talk and uh, beautiful uh, presentation, Stephen. Thank I you. just had I just had a uh, a general question. So these were the systems involving the fluid mechanics, but as you mentioned, that there are other systems such as combustion systems, which are much more complex, where you have the chemical kinetics and uh, all other aspects involved. So how do you see this data driven uh, mechanism to kind of generalize onto those complex systems as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and the good news is that researchers are applying these methods in tons of other fields that are super complex. So, um, you know, vibrational structures and elastics, they've been doing this, uh, plasma systems like fusion reactors. Um, our colleagues in Germany are applying these for uh, molecular modeling of, um, you know, complex uh, chemicals and their interactions for reduced order modeling. And so it seems like there is some hope of, of applying this to more complex systems. Um, so turbulence and combustion are generally more challenging because they truly are high dimensional and multi scale. And so it's hard to find a latent space with three variables where, you know, it's easy to do Cindy. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, but yeah. I will point out that um, Jared Callahan and others have essentially built a stochastic version of the Cindy algorithm. So if you have a truly turbulent or multi-scale system where there are dominant coherent structures that can be described by X, and then there's multi-scale kind of forcing at smaller scales that can be described as this correlated noise, you can simultaneously learn kind of the coarse dynamics and the noise forcing. Um, this is actually building on uh, another earlier kind of stochastic Cindy for those molecular dynamics I was telling you about. Um, for systems in combustion in particular, I'm actually very interested in combustion because there are, just like we have known conservation laws and fluids that can guide our constraints and make our models more physical and more uh, kind of better at generalizing, you can do the same thing in combustion. So I've been talking a lot with, uh, with combustion researchers for example, if I look at something like hydrogen burning, we know the different reaction pathways and the different products that can be generated by hydrogen burning or methane burning. And we know that at each of those stages, there is a conservation of elements. And so, you know, we know that, that totally there's going to be a conservation of like, you know, thermal energy. And so you can actually add those in as constraints into the combustion to get better reduced order combustion mechanisms too. And that's something we're actively working on currently. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it all together, we don't really have a, you know, I don't know how that's gonna work yet though. Yeah, that, that was quite an interesting point about the con, con, uh, conservation laws. So like, that's what I've been wondering. Let's say we have quantum computers in, you know, in a decade or so, uh, we know that they, uh, the numerical simulations in fluid mechanics are very uh, intensive right now, like finite volume or finite element systems. So I was wondering like if these can be complement those, give them a guidance or, uh, you know, somehow generalize from a number of simulations onto other possible scenarios, which also for example, right now, if you want to do a simulation, let's say for a, you know, for a combustion system, uh, you would run based on some, uh, you know, initial, uh, like, you know, uh, some given pressure or temperature or some other parameters, but you want to also be able to generalize that effectively so that you don't have to run given all possible parameters. So I was wondering if, if these sort of data-driven models can also help with those. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, okay. So I'm not a quantum computing expert. Uh, we are currently doing a quantum computing cluster higher at my university, so I'm learning about it. Um, 
there's a couple of, of really important points that I want to kind of tease out of, of your questions. The first one is that the models we typically care about are parameterized, right? So we the way we use these models is to design and optimize and control systems like wings and turbines and jets and things like that. And we don't just collect data from one operating condition at one parameter value. So here, sigma, rho, and beta are the parameters. We would actually query that system at multiple parameter values and try to infer what that model would do at unseen parameter values. So that's like a surrogate exactly. model that we could use for inverse design. Now, this framework in particular I like because you can actually add in those measured parameters into the features of this library theta. You can have columns like rho times x or beta y or beta z, and you can actually figure out what the parameterization is. But you're asking a bigger question, which is kind of in general, how can we handle these large scale parameterized systems? Um, and I actually think that that's probably where quantum computing has the most promise. You know, it's not obvious to me if it's going to immediately speed up fluid simulations, but what it might allow us to do is seamlessly propagate uncertainty through our fluid simulations. So propagating distributions of uncertainty through a complex nonlinear system is extraordinarily un, uh, expensive. And that's what we need to do for these inverse designs. But a lot of these uh, kind of quantum computing architectures make it much, much easier to sample PDFs and probability density functions. And so there's some chance you can actually kind of almost for free get these additional statistics that you can make uh, really, really effective use of. Yeah, so like right. Formula One car engineers, they're not running one simulation of their car, they're running multiple simulations and they're trying to figure out an uncertainty envelope for what happens if it rains or it's nice or it's this or it's that. And they want this kind of weighted probability density. Some of that you might be able to get for free. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. I'm not sure I answered thank your you. question, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, it did answer my question. And my last question was, how hard is it to write the other way on the glass? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, it's funny, you're right. I get that question a lot. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to give my secrets away. I, yeah. I will tell you, I was really bored in a math class once, uh, a pure math class. This is why I switched to applied math. Uh, and I learned how to write forward and backward with both of my hands to take notes. Yeah, Which made right. those pretty useless, but. Quite a scale, yeah. Anyway, thanks again. Thanks. Uh, so we've also got, uh, as long as you're happy to stay just for another few minutes. Sure. Uh, we've yeah. got another question in the chat and that is, what is uh, your opinion on GANs uh, for reconstructing missing data or separating noise from the data? Yeah, so I think GANs are awesome. Um, if you talk to anyone who trains neural networks regularly, they'll tell you that these are some of the trickiest objects to train. So they are not an entry level kind of lightweight you know, intro to ML project. This is kind of like, you know, heavy machinery that even the experts find hard to, to train. Um, but, you know, generative modeling is really exciting, right? It allows you to, again, it's another way of probing what is that kind of statistical structure that underlies this complex system. Uh, and it's a pretty powerful way of, of modeling that. Um, you know, my group hasn't, hasn't uh, really developed any GAN architectures for these physics um, Kind of inspired learning. Uh, I want to say that the PINs, the Physics Informed Neural Networks um, of Carniadakis and group, have done some GANs. Probably my favorite GAN work in the literature um, is with Frank Noe and collaborators at FU Berlin. Uh, and they've done some really, really cool. Uh, architectures, they, they call it their deep Boltzmann generator, where they essentially uh, kind of use this physics uh, inspired generative um, generative algorithm. And it's it's really incredible. They can do things that were, you know, kind of only dreamt of before. So uh, any, you know, I talked about fluid mechanics in my world of what we do for interpretable modeling. There's this other, you know, fantastic uh, group of work related to like Frank Noe and what you know his collaborators, uh, Kluse and Schuta and others, Kultai are doing, um, kind of in that that German group. So highly recommend looking after that work as well. Great, thank you. Okay, should we? Uh, what do you think? Should we call it a day? Let's do it. Yeah, thank you okay. so much. <laughs> 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, we really appreciate this. And, uh, and I'll uh, stop the recording now and, uh, and put it up on YouTube.